We're just absolutely thrilled to end our conference with two speakers that I have to admit, when we were doing brainstorming for this event almost a year ago now, we we're thinking about what would be kind of the coolest, just somewhat unusual seeming for a law and policy kind of conference folks to bring in. Who would we most like to hear about? And uh, the names of both of our speakers were the ones that popped up from our team. I think largely it was our senior fellow for copyright, Sandra A. Stars, and our director of operations, Christina Pietro. And we really had no idea whether this would actually work, uh, but we were able to reach out and we were just um, absolutely delighted and thrilled that both uh, have agreed to join us. Um, now, I've let them both know, they know we had a full day and a half of events so far with lots of technical details on AI, and both of them can speak about that a lot as well. But obviously with them, we'd really like to hear much more about the kind of bigger picture. Where is all this going? And especially get it from the artistic and scientific and technological perspectives. Because a lot of us so far on this conference have been more on the law and policy side. But what we really need to know and be hearing from are the leaders out in the field who are actually engaging with AI right now and having it be a part of what they do, what they create, what they invent, and let us know how this works. What should policymakers be thinking about? And so that's what I'm hoping for, uh, that our policymakers who have joined us will be listening to this loud and clear and hear what both have to say. So the format is that I'll do a quick introduction of both of them. We have, as everyone else's bios, in the, in the material, in the agenda, but I want to highlight some things about our two speakers. And then we'll go into, each will have 10 minutes to do some of their opening remarks, to give their overall perspective. Then we'll go into a period of some directed questions from me, which are quite open-ended and somewhat sort of softball questions, but I want to further structure the dialogue a bit. And then we will uh, have time for audience Q&A, which I know a lot of you will be quite interested in asking questions. I want to ask the audience again, though, please do put your questions in the Q&A function in Zoom here, not in the chat. It's hard to kind of toggle back and forth between both of them. So, and we need the, the chat for technical things that may come up. So please do use the Q&A. Okay, so now, starting the order, we have it in the agenda here. Um, Jaron Lanier, I think all of you know of him already. He's a scientist, musician, visual artist, and author. Um, he's put a number of books out, but the key thing that you all are probably well aware of with Jaron is that he's been in the Valley, Silicon Valley, and in the tech field really since its inception and has been there every step of the way. In fact, coining the term virtual reality, he's been involved in just pretty much everything digital that's been going on. Um, but while he was deeply steeped from that angle, then he started writing books, putting things out there. One of the first was You Are Not a Gadget, a manifesto. It was a bestseller in the U.S. and internationally. And then he went even broader with Who Owns the Future? And that really was one of the first books to start critiquing the economics of the internet, starting to get us all focused on what's really behind the curtain, what's actually going on, how are things being monetized, and what do we all not know about how we're, we're being monetized, essentially. So that was fantastic. And then he put out some, some more personal works, collection of essays, Rentrauma, the Waschen Werden, which shows my limited high school German classes, but when dreams grow up, and then Dawn of the New Everything, which was a memoir. Um, and then he moved into one that I think a lot of us are quite well aware of, 10 Arguments for Deleting Your Social Media Accounts Right Now, really honing in on the potential perils of social media. As fun as it seems to be, and as much as we all use it, there are some issues with there. Um, so again, these are all have been best-selling books. Um, he's currently the octopus for Microsoft, which I love that. But that really is the Office of the Chief Technology Officer, prime unifying scientist at Microsoft. And kudos to them for, uh, for creating such a position too. Um, he's been on everyone's sort of top you know, lists of, of technologists. Um, he appears in major media all the time and has been a consultant on movies. And I just want to also flag then his featured role in The Social Dilemma, which was really a great wake up call, even for my own kids who you know, were all big users of social media. So that was great. He's a musician and has done quite a bit with the, the new classical music with a lot of eclectic instruments um, and has done a work about Shakespeare's contemporary and friend, Amelia Lanier, who I wonder, and he may answer or not on this, is a uh, ancestral relative. I don't know, could just be a coincidence with the name. He's performed with just an amazing group of musicians that you'll see in the bio. So again, we have Jaron Lanier. And next we have Grimes. And Grimes is a music producer, songwriter, singer, an innovator in digital and AI art space. 
Grimes uh, came to his attention and really showed the potential of GarageBand, which many of us have played with and thought, oh, GarageBand, it's not really that, that great. There's things like Pro Tools, there's better systems. But she was able to leverage GarageBand and get out there in a way that no one else really had with her first album, Visions. And then she went on to continue self-producing albums, which from my amateur musician knowledge myself is no small feat, getting something from some cool ideas and some cool sounds into something that can be distributed around the world, played commercially, uh, is really quite, quite a challenge. And she had the critically claimed Art Angels, and then as she says, the critically disliked, but much better performing Miss Anthropocene. And I have to say, Miss Anthropocene was the one that uh, brought her to my attention through my favorite indie station in Seattle, KEXP. Uh, they break a lot of fantastic artists. But I'd also say that her distinction of how these did with critics is more a commentary on critics uh, than it is about the, the quality of these albums, which both are just excellent self-produced. She's also done Emmy-winning opening credits for the Netflix series Hilda and has voiced a cyborg pop star in Cyberpunk 2077. She paid her dues touring in vans, as everyone must, uh, and then, but now it can be a festival headliner. And so you'll see her in, in many venues and especially now they're all coming back online and in person. On her visual artist side, she's directed some of her music videos. And she's also, and this is something we wanna talk about a bit today is uh, dropped her own NFT. And that's something that is really, as we know, is emerging, it's quite a big topic. What does it mean? What exactly does the NFT do as far as what rights it conveys or not? So we'll discuss that a little bit. Um, and it's done a lot in the digital art space. She's also worked with an AI music generation app, Endel, that won the Apple Watch Award uh, in 2020. And then is a, she is a provocateur and philosopher who has opined quite a bit and gotten some attention for her comments on AI, obviously, but also futurism and luxury communism. So with that, I want to turn it first to Jaron to give his opening remarks. Jaron, the floor is yours. <laughs> hey. Uh, God, I sort of feel like it's hard to follow up on this interest. Um, so uh, you, just to answer your question, Amelia Lanier, uh, one of the few people Shakespeare knew and who was the first uh, uh, the first published female poet in the English language, is not a relative, but her name was made up. Her family were refugees from anti-Semitism fleeing to London. Uh, my dad chose it as a name when he was he was doing the same thing. Some people are convinced we are direct descendants. For instance, uh, Quincy Jones is a direct descendant of Amelia Lanier. His mother was a Lanier uh, because she has a whole line in Barbados. And so uh, it's a hope that's a, a fascinating story and captures a little bit of our, our uh, history. Anyway, my opening remarks on topic are... Um, <clears throat> I love technology. I love the internet. I'm very happy to have devoted my life to it so much. And yet we did make a couple of wrong turns. The main wrong turn we made was a kind of a political and economic bundle of ideas, which is uh, uh, if, uh, if what we really, really believe in, and many of my friends do, is making computers intelligent, making them smart, that agenda requires a whole lot of data because uh, intelligence doesn't exist in a vacuum ever of any kind. And so there was this idea, well, we do this uh, advertising business model where we get paid by people uh, to influence those who use our services and in exchange we get their data and then that feeds our AIs. Now, the problem with that is uh, manifold. Uh, for one thing, there's a sense of um, superiority among the people running it versus the ordinary people, like the people who get to run those things. Those are people like me who are, who are highly technical and are associated with Silicon Valley get to be sort of the master planners and everybody else is kind of uh, just along for the ride and has less power, less autonomy, less influence. And people gradually can feel that because it's authentic. Uh, and that's a problem. There's no reason for that to be true. You can make all the same algorithms without that political order. There's, but that's nonetheless what we did. Part of why we did it is uh, there were all of these ideologies that people believed in so much, but the ideologies were in conflict. On the one hand, we were supposed to be sort of socialists where everything would be free and anything that you had to pay for, especially music, that would be horrible. All culture had to be free. But on the other hand, we had to be great tech entrepreneurs and make a lot of money and become really powerful. And you can't have pure socialism and entrepreneurial 
ideals at the same time, except in one little tiny point where those two things intersect, which is the advertising business model. Because then you can create this illusion that everything's free for people while still getting, becoming, a, you know, building a giant company and everything. So that, in a way, people were forced into it. I knew some of the people who pioneered this, especially at Google, where I sold them a company right when they were starting. And they were kind of backed into a corner. The ideologies were so thick. I don't think they could have done anything if they didn't choose this one little point that satisfied all of these conflicting ideologies. But anyway, not only does it concentrate all the power with these master planner hackers like me, but also it just turns out that if you want to do this business plan and you have these algorithms kind of engaging people and getting data from them, the issue with that is that our ability to sense people is pretty crude. I mean, even if we're humans, we have trouble understanding each other. That's part of the human experience. And if it's an algorithm, just using whatever sensors there are on a phone, it's terrible. And so the only things that can really get emphasized are these fight or flight response, lizard brain kind of primitive things. And so it ends up <clears throat> happening is no matter what the algorithm is, no matter what the intent is, no matter who the people are, no matter what any other factor in the situation is, just this whole scheme tends to make people more irritable, paranoid, xenophobic, narrow-minded. It just, and it not hugely, I mean, it's like, usually when this is measured, it's like 1% a year change in personality on average. It's very slight, but it's somewhat cumulative, like compound interest and gradually shifts the feeling of society. And the thing is, People and politics and human culture have always been a little crazy. We've always been a little paranoid. We've always been a little nutty. But it's always been just shy of threatening our total destruction. You know, like we've always basically gotten it together and found some thread of sanity. Um, but this stuff is kind of pushing us. And I'm just like afraid it's like pushing us over that edge. And so that's that becomes the main problem. And then you can identify all the little specific instances of this. Does social media make teenage girls um, more uh, psychologically challenged in different ways? Yeah, that appears to be true. I'd say that the preponderance of research shows that there's something there. But I rather than pick on just one thing like that, which is gonna be an endless research question. I think we need to lay back and just look at the overall pattern. Um, and if this was the only way to do anything, that would be one thing, but there's this other way to do things. If you decide, you know what? We live in a market-based society. We actually have companies, we have investors, we have money, like these are real things in our lives. None of us are actually willing to give these things up. So when people contribute their data, whether it's intentional or not, whether they're thinking about it or not, when they contribute data to technology, why not let them get paid? And, if, and, and so I can talk about that a little later, but there's this interesting way where if you make data be something that people get paid for instead of having it be free, a lot of these problems reverse magically. You suddenly have people who feel that they're authentically feel that they are part of this new world of technology, that they're having an influence, that they're making things better. They're not just passive recipients of this world that's being created by only a few people. It makes the technology better. It doesn't hurt companies. It's not anti-commercial. It actually is a tide that raises all boats. This is a principle we call data dignity. It's not a technology change, same algorithms, same robots, but a different political and sociological and psychological and, and social surrounding. To, and it just makes everything better. And since we do have this alternative and we have some trials that have tested it uh, at least initially, and it looks like it works, um, there's really not any excuse to continue this practice that seems to make people crazy and make them uh, authentically feel powerless and uh, we can do better. And it's a, it's a great example where just getting an idea right can actually make a difference. I think a lot of times people who enjoy thinking like me put too much stock in ideas, but I think this is a case where a better idea can really, really make a difference. And it's a way to improve the world without having to select a class of people who are villains. It's a way to improve the world without um, 
uh, without adding conflict on the way. It's, it's a positive win-win approach. So that's what I wanna to advocate today.